It, it is really great to see so many of you, uh, so many Village Square members and guests back for this, our third Village Square program of the current fiscal year. And it's great to see so many students in the audience. Uh, they are here in um, large part because of generous donations uh, from board members and friends of the Institute for Strategic Policy Solutions, the presenters of uh, tonight's program. Uh, I want to take a moment to recognize these donors as well as the various disciplines represented by our students. Uh, first, there are two tables uh, sponsored by this campus, by the Seminole Campus Student Government Association. Uh, seated there are Student Government Association officers uh, as well as majors in the Public Policy and Administration program. Uh, will the SGA officers and Public Policy um, majors in the audience please stand and be recognized? <laughs> Next, we have uh, two tables of students from SPC's College of Education. One was sponsored by Judge George Greer, the president of the Institute's Board of Directors, and the second by Dr. Kanika Tomlin, Vice President of the Institute's Board of Directors. They could not be with us tonight, but we want to recognize them with a round of applause. <laughs> and will the education uh, students, accompanied by Dean Kimberly Hartman of the SPC College of Education, please stand to be recognized, education students. <laughs> Next, there's a table uh, of students from St. Pete College's uh, College of Social Sciences, uh, sponsored by Joanne Clement, wife of the Institute Executive Director and Board Secretary, David Clement, in honor of her late father, Jerry Patterson, a devoted educator. Uh, Joanne, are you with us this evening? Joanne, very good. And the social science faculty and students, would you please stand and be recognized? <clears throat> And finally, uh, Dr. Uh, Harold Bill Heller, uh, the treasurer of the Institute Board, Dean of Education at the University of South Florida, St. Petersburg, and moderator of tonight's program, has sponsored two tables, of uh, uh, faculty and students from the Bishop Center for Ethical Leadership and the USF St. Petersburg College of Education. USF, as you all know, is a partner of St. Petersburg College. Dr. Heller, thank you, and USF St. Pete, uh, students and faculty, please stand and be recognized. We certainly also want to uh, acknowledge our media co-sponsors this evening, the Tampa Bay Times, WEDU Television, and WUSF Public Media. Let's give them a round of applause, please. And a special round of applause for the sponsor of the founding member reception this evening, Hill and Knowlton Strategies Incorporated, a brand new supporter of the Institute. Uh, are there any Hill and Knowlton guests here this evening? All right, very good. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you very much. Tonight's program focuses on an issue that's near and dear to the hearts of just about everyone, especially all of us here at St. Petersburg College, education. We're obviously in the education business. And while tonight's focus is on K-12 education, we recognize the importance of that sector in preparing students for what we have to offer them, a rich college experience. Without well-educated high school graduates, our job is made, is made much, much harder. So I applaud the St. Petersburg College Institute for Strategic Policy Solutions for taking tonight's very topical and sometimes controversial issue uh, to this group. There are many opinions about testing, and we hope to give voice to all of them tonight. That is the mission of the Institute and the Village Square entity, to debate tough issues uh, of the day in a civil, nonpartisan way. Now, the program says that I was to introduce the president of the college, Dr. Bill Law, but uh, unfortunately, Dr. Law uh, was called to, to Tallahassee. It is the season, after all. Uh, to be part of uh, some legislative hearings that are going on uh, this week. He sends his regrets uh, at missing this important program. I know he was really looking forward to being here. In his place, uh, David Clement, uh, the Executive Director of the Institute for Strategic Policy Solutions, will bring that welcome. David?
Thank you, Dr. Oliver. And may I, <clears throat> excuse me, add my welcome and thanks to all of you for attending and special thanks also to our media sponsors and the sponsors of our founders reception. And seeing so many students, may I just put in a little plug for them. If you see, notice the little blue, uh, blue and white, uh, red uh, containers on your tables, if you feel so in inclined to throw in a dollar or two to help support student meals for future programs. And while we're recognizing folks, he won't like me for this, but I would like to recognize someone who had an important role in creating the Institute and helping it get off the ground. Senator Dennis Jones retired at the end of December as the vice president of the college and as uh, the founder, the creator and founder of the Institute as well as retiring from the legislature after 32 years. Uh, we, we, I want you to know we miss him terribly, but, and, but we're glad that he came back to us tonight uh, with his wife, Susan, to share this meal and this program. Senator Jones. <clears throat> And there's one other program change. Uh, unfortunately, the flu bug struck one of the members of the panel that's on your program, Joanne McCall, the representative of the Florida Education Association. And uh, we scrambled to find a replacement today. And I'm happy to report and welcome to the panel Nancy Milchamp, who is a librarian at Madeira Beach Fundamental School. She's a 35-year a uh, national board certified teacher in the Pinellas school system. Thank you, Nancy. And now to the program. She'll get, we'll get formal introductions when the program begins, but uh, Dr. Oliver mentioned the importance of K-12 in preparing students for college. How very well we recognize that need at St. Petersburg College for the success of K-12 determines the, the academic readiness of students who come to our doors. We want the students to be ready to do college work. Unfortunately, that doesn't always happen, and as a result, some of them uh, spend their first semesters, or part of them, in remediation. <clears throat> usually, we're usually reading, reading and math, but we recognize that K-12 has made huge pro uh, progress in recent years, and FCAT certainly played a large role in that progress. But we know that more needs to be done, and we hopefully will learn more about that in the next 90 minutes. It, it is not as if there is a choice. Today, we're in a new world where me of metrics, an ever-growing demand for measurement and accountability in education across the board, but especially higher education. As Dr. Oliver said, this is a topic for the Village Square, the reason why we were created. To shed light on controversial issues like tonight's topic, testing. Thanks for being part of it. And if you're not a member, please consider joining the Village Square. You see the emblems on the screens. And now, dinner is served. Good evening again, everyone. And uh, just continue eating. Uh, I know, uh, just judging from my own table, that we were not able to finish the good food that we have. But uh, if you will, that uh, dinner was catered by Marguerite's Cafe and Catering in Dunedin. So if you will, will you give the chef a little applause? And again, just uh, continue uh, eating, because the, uh, the panel is going to give you a lot of food for thought, but you can also uh, supplement that with what you have on your table. Uh, when we first began thinking of a uh, program on education, uh, we kind of thought mostly uh, at that time, we're looking back a little ways, uh, about doing a program on FCAT. And that's that controversial test that uh, has caused so much anxiety for so many people for so many families and so many uh, students for the past 14 years. But as we began researching uh, the FCAT, we learned that the issue of accountability in K-12 education is much larger than the FCAT itself. In fact, we discovered that the FCAT is rapidly using up its nine lives. 
if indeed it had that many to begin with. For Florida is already committed its whole different kind of a philosophy and method of measuring success in public schools. It's called the Common Core Standards. And we're fortunate uh, here in Pinellas County, and I, I think, and, and the school board members are here, uh, that they've been a, really ahead of the curve on, on implementing uh, the Common Core. But it, it is a nationalized, national standards-based curriculum, and it will come out with a new assessment uh, tool. So tonight, we're going to look at what those standards mean and how they differ from FCAT. We won't ignore FCAT. We want to hear from the representatives our, of teachers who have had to administer it all these years and of parents who have had to deal with the impact of the FCAT on their children. By the end of the evening, we hope that you will have a better understanding of the issue of testing, accountability, assessment, and student success. To help us do that, we have before you assembled a distinguished panel representing stakeholder com components in this debate. We will ask each to spend some few minutes talking about testing and assessment from their perspective. Then we'll engage in a discussion of some of the issues raised in their opening comments. And we will save the last portion, as we always do of these programs, for your questions. Now let me start by introducing our panel, and as I go down the list, because I was scripted first, and we've changed some things, as you uh, know, uh, so I've just asked them to uh, raise their, their hand. But in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into their uh, biographies. You have in your program a synopsis of their uh, achievements and qualifications, and indeed, we're very fortunate uh, to have this panel uh, convene here this evening. First, I want to talk and introduce to you Pam Stewart. Raise your hand, Pam. She's the Chancellor of the Public Schools, Florida Department of Education. Next, Nancy Milchamp, who you've already had some uh, introduction to, a 35-year-old, 35-year uh, teacher. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll trade you, I'll trade you. Uh, but, well, you know, but we have a, a certain kind of affinity because she is a school media specialist, a librarian, and I've been married, it'll be 59 years in, on February 8th, to a school media specialist. <laughs> but she uh, is replacing uh, Joanne McCall, from, who is the vice president uh, of the Florida Education Association, who couldn't make it here tonight. And so she's representing uh, the teachers uh, on this panel. Next, Mindy Haas. She's president-elect of the Florida Parent Teacher Association. After Mindy, Doug Tuthill, who's president of Step Up for Children, or for Students, excuse me. And finally, Dr. Michael Gregel, who's our school superintendent here in Pinellas County, and we're so lucky that he is here with us. Not just with us on this panel, but he's all, we're also very fortunate that he's our school superintendent. And as a university person, you know, you got to be careful. It used to be sometimes you get superintendents who maybe hadn't ever been in a university, just gone through it. This guy's been at a university. So, you know, he, when I talk to him, I got to talk to him in a different way because he knows our stories uh, very, very well. <laughs> so let's begin with Doug. And Doug, you know, set the stage for the discussion. And as a team member for the Education Commission in the 90s, it's my understanding that you had a role in writing the FCAT standards. So we'll ask you to give a brief. Uh, I got to go now. <laughs> we'll ask you to give a brief historical uh, perspective on the FCAT as as you saw it back then and how it is now. And you can either do it from there or you can come up here. Uh, yours fine? Yeah, yeah. Those should be mic. Okay. Yeah, I'm not always very popular when that gets part of the introduction. Um, <laughs> Woody Allen once, supposedly once read War and Peace in 20 minutes, and somebody asked him what it was about, and he said, Russia. So, so I'm going to go really fast, but uh, this is the history of, of FCAT. Um, and I'm going to try to just hit some benchmarks for you that hopefully um, some key themes that um, I, I think will elucidate, uh, hopefully, the discussion today. 
Um, the, the accountability and assessment and standards movement in Florida really started, had its roots in the 80s. In the mid-80s, Florida was one of the leading uh, states in the country in the area of, of site-based decision-making and teacher empowerment. In Pinellas particularly, uh, we, we, we negotiated some of the most innovative contracts about decentralization and trying to uh, give teachers and folks in the buildings much more influence over the kind of decisions that they made. Unfortunately, by the end of the 80s, it was clear that the, uh, the site-based teacher empowerment movement was not really moving the needle as it relates to student achievement. And as we analyzed what was going wrong, we found ourselves sort of mired in, um, in a situation where we had a hard time distinguishing between change and improvement. They aren't the same. We were doing lots of, our site-based decision-making teams were doing lots of, improve, or lots of change efforts, but we really weren't um, engaging in improvements, and we were getting very frustrated. The, uh, the issue for me uh, was highlighted one afternoon at St. Pete High, where I taught, where we spent an hour and a half in a, a school improvement team meeting debating whether or not the teacher's name should be painted on the uh, spots in the faculty parking lot. Half the folks said it, that was really important so that in the morning your spot was there, you could, you could, you could park quickly. The other folks said that's a terrible idea because if you're late, the principal will know you're late and be able to identify it. <laughs> so after an hour and a half of this debate, I, I, I meditated on, on suicide and, and figured that, that this was really not what school improvement ought to be all about. And so uh, Betty Castor was the commissioner and um, a lot of us talked and, and really Betty was the driver uh, behind what we call Blueprint 2000. Blueprint 2000 was passed in 91 and it really had three major components. We still believed in, in this decentralization. We thought that, that public education was over-regulated, I still think it is, and we wanted to return more control uh, to the parents and to the teachers um, and, and the other folks at the school building. That's why you have school advisory councils today. That came out of legislation. The other thing that we wanted to do was create standards so that uh, we had a sense statewide about what we were trying to accomplish at various grade levels as it relates to academic learning. And we wanted to develop an assessment system because the assessment system was, is what makes the standards real. And, and, and so uh, the assessment would be derived from the standards. I got the short straw, so I got to chair the standards uh, committee to develop the standards. And um, we looked around and uh, we settled on a, a set of standards that came out of the uh, U.S. Department of Labor called the uh, SCANS uh, report. And it looked at uh, skills in the, in the 21st century and uh, it obviously had basic literacy skills but also had things like problem solving, critical thinking, a lot of things that, that progressive educators have been talking about since the early 1900s. And we really wanted to make sure that was part of it. So we had these really robust debates and we all agreed that these are the standards that we were going to use and we went out and had public hearings and it was a disaster. Uh, because we look at those standards, the question is how are you going to assess those standards? Uh, it's one thing to assess basic literacy, it's another thing to assess problem solving, creativity, you know, how do, how do you do that? The folks in DOE freaked out because uh, they had just been sued a couple years ago in the famous DEPAP uh, uh, case, which was a, uh, a suit against standardized testing because of issues of racial discrimination and they were concerned about any kind of subjectivity in the evaluation and when you're evaluation problem solving and critical thinking, it's hard to do that um, without, ki without teachers and, and, and kids doing authentic kinds of activities and that revolves some judgment in terms of evaluation. So DOE was, uh, they hated me and they, they beat me up and beat me up and beat me up um, on that particular issue. Teachers also hated me, which is problematic because at the time I was, I was the president of the teachers union in Pinellas and I was the appointee of the state teachers union as a representative on, on the committee. Um, but um, teachers are very concerned about the work uh, that, that would be involved with, with teachers in doing these kinds of assessments. Um, I had moved back to Florida in the early 80s to help create the international baccalaureate program at St. Pete High. And I was in love with that assessment system because it has a combination of multiple measures. It has some external assessments, but also has a robust internal assessment so that you get a nice combination of, of, of kids' classroom work as well as an external check on it. And the other thing I love about the IB is that um, the teachers do a lot of that assessment uh, working with their kids. They know the kids, so you're in a better position, I think, to judge what they can and cannot do. And it's, and it's work that's accumulated sometimes over a two-year period. So it's not a single snapshot. You have a lot of uh, data points, which as you know, the more data points you have, the higher the probability you're gonna get a, a more reliable and valid uh, measure. Um, but there's a lot of work. I mean, if you're an IB teacher, you're working your fanny off. And, and teachers said, look, there's no way we're gonna do that much work uh, for an assessment system. And I had teachers you know, beating me up saying, I'm gonna have uh, shopping carts pulling around the school with all the papers of portfolios and things like that. So there was an uprising on, the, on behalf of the teachers saying, you know, we refuse to have an assessment system that's that intrusive. Um, and so that all got blown up. And so you basically ended up with an FCAT that 
it was basic literacy. I mean, we did, we did uh, reading, writing, and math. By the way, the, uh, the, the writing portion uh, was already in place. Florida Rights actually was there before the rest of uh, FCAT. Um, FCAT was a significant superior assessment to what, what it replaced. It replaced something called the CTBS, which is basically a minimum, a minimum competency skills test. And so the, the, the assessment itself is, is far superior, I think, to, to, the, to CTBS. Um, and, it, and generally, people thought, felt good about it. And, and it, it wasn't particularly controversial because we'd already been testing kids every year, and this was simply a, a, a better test. It wasn't the assessment I wanted. It wasn't an assessment that I think a lot of the progressive educators thought we needed. But it was, a, it was, a, it was, a, it was an improvement. Um, the area where really uh, the, the commission uh, melted down was on the area of accountability. And that's where I think the controversy is. When people think about FCAT, you think FCAT's controversial because testing is, con it's really how the tests are being used. If, if you use the FCAT the same way we use the TTBS, FCAT would not be controversial. It's controversial because of how it's used. And so the, the commission basically was at a deadlock over how to use, how to use the, uh, the scores. There was a strong sense of, of some folks that it, um, that you know, we need to sort of use a lot of carrots and sticks to drive uh, people's behaviors. I was opposed to uh, what I thought was a coercive system that undermined what I understood about um, how you motivate people. I, my side lost, um, and so I resigned. Betty left. A bunch of us left, and and eventually, um, you know, when uh, Jeb came in in '98. By the way, people say Jeb Bush created FCAT, which is absolutely not true. The entire system was built before Jeb got elected. Uh, it, it was everything in place. Only thing Jeb did was look at it and said, you know, he, he, brought, he brought a really strong hand to it. And what Jeb said is, there's a huge achievement gap out there, and I'm going to use the FCAT data to, to force districts to put more resources and attention to the needs of high poverty kids. And so it became um, a strong-fisted, top-down uh, system, and that, be, that became controversial. A few points and I'll shut up. One more. Okay. okay. Um, Today, I think we have a, a, a huge opportunity that, that we didn't have in the 90s. I mean, I think I, think, I, think I, was, out of, I was out of sequence for about 30 years. I mean, I was, I was, just, I was 30 years out of, out of whack. Because I think what's going to happen is we have technology now that is going to transform the assessment systems. The new Common Core assessments is primarily going to be an assessment, um, uh, an online assessment system. And you can do things with IT now that are just incredible that we couldn't do before. So all the concerns that teachers had about about you know, how I'm going to do this. A lot of that can be answered with, with technology. And so I think what you're going to see is the technology dramatically transform the discussion. It's also going to dramatically transform public, public education in ways where a lot of the old top-down accountability systems don't make any sense. For example, if you have kids taking courses from three or four different schools at the same time, what does a grade mean? How do you grade a school for a child's performance when the child's taking courses from three or four different institutions? So I think what you're going to see is some of the old top-down accountability systems which we've had are going to begin to not make sense as we, as we build a public education system around um, customization and an assessment system that's aligned to customization. All right, thank you, Doug. And uh, you'll have a chance to ask him some uh, questions uh, later, and then we'll come around also back to the panel with some other kind of things. But I'm kind of going to change the order a little bit here now, and I'm going to let, you know, uh, uh, Chancellor Stewart kind of come last because we're going to talk about transforming, you know, transferring from the FCAP into the Common Core. And, uh, you know, I think what I want to hear now then is to get to this, the school uh, folks that are involved with what Doug and his group uh, kind of started. And again, maybe what Jeb gets a lot of uh, punishment for, but as you know, uh, you, you see the sequence here. But I'd like now to uh, ask Nancy if you will, you know, give us some thoughts from a uh, instructional teacher's uh, viewpoint uh, on, on the FCAD and testing and the accountability as it impacts you. I'll do the best I can. Uh, I found out about this meeting at 3 o'clock this afternoon. So <laughs> unlike Doug, I will not be as well prepared. Um, <laughs> let me just say that that was kind of a trip down memory lane for me, though, because um, oh, okay, I started in 1975, fresh out of college, came to Florida as a reading teacher, and was horrified when I gave my first test to my students to find that I had students in high school, at Seminole High School, in fact, uh, who tested out at the pre-kindergarten level. And uh, we were doing something wrong, obviously. Uh, it wasn't that I looked around and I saw that my colleagues were not working. They were busting their butts. Uh, everybody was working hard, but something was dramatically wrong. Um, 
I remember the Sunshine State standards being put in place that made perfect sense to me. We would teach to standards and have goals and objectives that would be tied to those. Uh, but then when No Child Left Behind came along in 2002, it seemed like the standards movement got hijacked and testing became the be all and end all and, and schools and students were being treated like businesses. And maybe punishments and rewards work at the business level, but they do not work at the school level. And we've been paying that price ever since, in my estimation. Um, once that came out, every state was left to determine their own test. So Florida had a test, Texas had a test, every state doing their own thing, every state setting their own bar. Um, consequently, those numbers meant nothing. And they changed every year, and we never knew where the bar was. And um, it's very simplistic, overly simplistic, to give a letter grade to a school, and that was uh, when Governor Bush came in. Um, and now the stakes became very high for everyone. And uh, at, initially, it all sounded good. Uh, testing, accountability, we'll see where the kids uh, need extra help, and we can tie that to our instruction. But that's not the way it played out. Um, there were punishments, and schools who did not perform were micromanaged. The state came in and investigated and looked to see what you had on your walls, and do you have enough words posted on your walls? These are how we were evaluated, okay, by things that don't really seem to have any actual tie to instruction, in my estimation. Again, I am up here as a librarian from one school speaking for all teachers. Gulp. Uh, so, I'm only telling you about my experience, and um, I'm hoping to see some of my buds out there. Yeah, there you go, head nod. Okay. Um, so these simplistic, unreliable um, letter grades and, and test scores that don't mean anything became so important that I actually had a principal say that, well, what they're teaching doesn't matter because it is not tested. So the curriculum became narrowed, and reading and math were really all that mattered anymore. And we were told constantly, we are all reading teachers. We are all math teachers. Well, I don't know about you, but I have a child that went to school. When I sent her to science, I wanted her to learn science. And I wanted her to learn social studies. And that's why we have those people who have specialized in those areas. I found it incredibly frustrating and counterproductive. Um, also, schools that were being punished what a surprise, we're lower socioeconomic schools. Not that those children cannot succeed, but there is a correlation there. And the schools who already had easier students to deal with were being rewarded with cash. Um, it, that didn't seem right, and I, I stumbled into a position that happened to have uh, the higher socioeconomic kids. I'm getting rewarded, and I'm feeling guilty about that because my colleagues in other schools did not have that same opportunity. Um, this is all thank you to the FCAT. Sorry, Doug. Um, I'm glad you resigned. Um, this has led to the lowest teacher morale in my 35-year career. Um, we're, I mean, budget cuts are one thing. We understand that. But when the press berates us, uh, when we are held in contempt now, I, I was actually verbally assaulted by somebody when I told them that I was a teacher at one point. When that used to be a, a profession that was held in high esteem, um, and I, I attribute it to this high-stakes testing environment that we live in now uh, because I've never seen uh, teachers work harder than they do now. Uh, I'm hopeful that the new Common Core uh, system, I don't know what that test looks like. Uh, I'm hopeful that that will take us back in the right direction because I think the role of education is to provide uh, public education for our students to prepare them to be citizens and to make them enjoy learning, not to beat them to death with tests, which it feels like we do. Um, I see, I'm in a K-8, thank you very much. I'm in a K-8 school, so I see it from kindergarten all the way up, they're in there getting tested all the time. FAIR tests, FCAT explorers. So because of the concern about getting a good score, we spend an inordinate amount of time teaching them about the test, not teaching them to become better learners and critical thinkers. And it's a horrible mistake, and I hope we can recover from it as quickly as possible. I think sometimes, though, the speed was the issue. It was like, hurry up, make them accountable, uh, treat us like a business. And it, it felt like all that turned in, in the space of a decade. I was part of uh, the restructuring movement, I remember, at uh, 
Osceola High School. I was a leader of the committee there, and we were trying to go to what was then called the Copernican Plan block scheduling so that students would have more time in content areas and less time moving around between classes. And it was an exciting time. I have to agree with Doug, though. There was an awful lot of argument. We could never reach 70% <laughs> of anything. Um, so um, I bet I've probably rambled on enough. Um, I, I, I am concerned, though, about if we're going to make another test, let's be clear about making it a reliable and valid instrument that gives us feedback so that we can help our students and isn't used to punish us or grade us or the kids. It's supposed to be about educating them. And I think we've lost our way. So that's it. Well, thank you, Nancy. And, uh... Uh, all should thank you for filling in on such short notice. Uh, you did a beautiful job. And, uh, and I know those kids at Madeira Beach are very, very fortunate. Now I'd like to hear from and have you all hear from a parent, because we've heard from the teacher side. We know who started this uh, nice thing. And now I'd like to you know, see if uh, Mindy uh, can, can talk to you from a parent's uh, uh, point of view of how FCAT has impacted her as a parent and other parents that uh, she represents. Good evening. I'm going to give you a little perspective, take you back a little bit in time. Um, in 1897, the National Congress of Mothers was developed. Our founders were Alice McKellen Burney, who was a mother, a widow, and, a, and I'm sorry, and a teacher, <clears throat> and Phoebe Aberson Hurst. Everybody knows her famous son, William Randolph Hearst. The first meeting of the National Congress was held in Washington and just blew everybody out of the water. Nobody knew what this group of women were marching up on Capitol Hill. They wanted to know why, who were these people. Back then, women didn't vote. We had no rights. We were just mothers, people. Um, we looked good. Um, in 19, I'm sorry, <clears throat> um, the dinner was very delicious. It was very delicious. On February 17, 1987, the National Congress was developed and then turned into the National PTA. We are now celebrated with five million members across our nation. And today in Florida, we have 350, uh, 315,000 voices heard on the, on the Capitol as well in at the halls of Tallahassee. I apologize, I'm a little nervous, but I'll get over it and I'll be fine in two minutes. Um, PTA um, gives a lot of support to our parents and our teachers, but more than anything, we give resources. What I learned here tonight, I take back. Anyone that wants to give us information, we pass on to our parents. But more than anything, as a group, as an advocacy group, we lead our legislature, we go to our legislature and let them know what the parents want and what we're interested in. We have little input, but the input that we do have, they are listening. Um, 315,000 members is, it's a lot, but it's certainly not enough. So we, of course, ask all of our parents and teachers to join our unit so we can be a, lot, a loud and stronger voice um, I'm going to close this because this, anytime I'm reading, it always messes me up. So I'm going to say to um, some of the comments that were made, um, you know, they're preaching to the choir. A Florida PTA believes that if we do not make a change in the way that we educate our children, um, the trouble will still continue. We have some truly, truly gifted children in this state. And we must look at our children for who they are, the whole child, not testing our children. We cannot test them till they are scared to go to school. There, when FCAT um, in the last 10 years, I was a parent in a local unit and watched those children in total fear. And the teachers were stressed out and the administration was stressed out and kids couldn't be sick because if they missed their FCAT test, you know, there was not enough accountability and we needed to get this percentage. We need to make these changes now before it rolls out in 2014 or we'll be sitting in the same position that we are today. Our governor, our past governors, 
our Commissioner of Education hopefully will continue to listen to what PTA has to say. Um, like I said, we have a small voice, but we, we want to come out loud and strong and we want to let people know that parents, teachers, we work together. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, thank you, uh, Mindy. Uh, and now I, I want, you know, somebody who has to, you know, really kind of keep everything going, uh, keep the teachers on happy at the same time being effective in the classroom, making sure that the parents are satisfied with the instruction that they're getting, making sure that those who govern the school system and, and have the oversight and are elected by the citizens uh, are, are getting things done that the citizens really want and that indeed the dollar uh, that taxpayers pay is indeed being maximized and in this whole area of accountability that those dollars are, are counting and they're counting in a way that making our students uh, a much better learner and also ultimately then a better citizen for the county and, and the state that we live in. So now I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Greg Osi, uh, bring this all together before I, I, I move over to, uh, you know, Chancellor Stewart because she's going to move us into the more into the common core. But Michael, you've heard a, a lot of good I comments have. now. I have. And add to that, to keep the bo our board happy, I have two <laughs> board members here, um, Mrs. Lerner and Mrs. O'Shea, and thank you for being here. And to the yeah. college yeah. students. Yeah. <laughs> I want to say you're entering one of the most noble professions and the most important professions and don't ever let conversation like this, this is healthy conversation and um, you need to work in Pinellas County Schools and so see me after this, uh, yeah. this thing. But uh, this is a great profession and we learn from each other. And one of the things I'd, I'd probably start out by saying is that there's nothing wrong with assessments in per se. We are educating to a higher level today more minority students. We've closed the achievement gap. Our Hispanic students in the state of Florida are outperforming Hispanic students in this nation. Our African American students are outperforming African American students in the nation. The most recent results of both the Pearls and Tims and other national and international. And I recognize this is all about test, but we used to be at the very bottom of the barrel. Last in the United States and certainly last in the world. When we talk about economic development and, and world and international competition, we owe it to our children, black, white, Hispanic, whatever it is, to ensure them a sound educational system. The only purpose, in my opinion, for assessments is to drive instruction. Assessment is a wonderful tool that, that helps and assists the heart of this profession, and that's of teaching and learning. It was mentioned before that some of the dilemmas and some of the problems and some of the challenges we have are not faced based on an FCAT or based on an assessment. It's based on what we are doing with those assessments. The further you move away from the notion of driving instruction from the classroom teacher's perspective, so how much has, what, what have my students learned? What have they not learned? If they haven't learned, what do I do about it? Accountability has helped in many respects this state and many other states kind of understand what do we do with the students who aren't learning? How do we reteach? How do we differentiate their instruction? How do we let no child kind of slip through a crack? How do we raise the, the um, dropout rate because in, maybe in the 50s and 60s it was okay? The manual labor that was afforded to people to live a middle class in type of income is no longer there. The jobs are no longer there. The stakes are high. But that doesn't mean that we have to have high stakes test. And there's a big discrepancy with that. And so as part of the profession, I would plead to all of you to not turn around all of a sudden and criticize the FCAT or the testing per se, but rather to take that what we've learned to note, and I don't know if anybody would disagree that we've helped move certain elements of our profession and our profession in general. Take the best of that and let's, let's move and evolve from that. You're, you're right. I think some of the comments here is that we cannot continue on the right path. You know, we could debate about whether grading schools is good or bad. I mean, throw it out. But the, the fact is, is that we have to ensure that the population of Florida is well-educated. 
And the, the reality is, is that the, whether it be assessment, but more importantly, I, I would focus as a superintendent on the instruction, on training and working with teachers. They are the heart of the business. And as we teach the standards and transition into the common core, that will not only be the heart of the business, but continue to be, it's always curriculum, is how well do we teach and how well are students learning? The assessments like the play at the end of the evening of all the dress rehearsals, or it's the race, or it's the Olympic trials, or it's one of those things. The better prepared you are and the better the instruction is in the classroom, the easier the final exam, so to speak, the easier the SAT, the easier the, I mean, life is full of those final exams types of things. Now, I don't agree that we should make these things so high pressured and high stressed out, but that is, the, that is in many respects to what's happened to assessments with our legislators who continue to tap it as a means of delivering other products, as the means of saying, how do we accomplish that? Well, let's attach it to the FCAD, let's attach it to this. In education, uh, you know, after 33, 34 years, I've seen many times where a good concept, a great concept, whatever that might be, starts to be used for things that it wasn't originally designed to be used for. And in many respects, sometimes we're looking at this with, with a quote unquote assessment. An assessment in math and reading, which is not, nothing wrong with that. Assessment in writing, we want good writing skills, great writing skills for the job workforce. Companies tell us we want people who can read, comprehend, and write, compute. These are the things we want to deliver. These are the things that we're, we're, we're obligated to deliver to our students. So I always take a different twist of, of assessments or these issues centered around long-term growth, long-term improvement. Where were we in the 90s? And the history lesson that was provided earlier was very, was very good. I don't believe we could be sitting here today without some of Commissioner Castor's movements. And trust me, I lived through that blueprint for, for career, career success and all. We were struggling back then in criticizing it too. <laughs> and I still have a, uh, an old article, it was a Tampa Tribune article when I think it was Commissioner Brogan who was requiring that Algebra I was a high school graduation. And both Pinellas and Hillsborough and other counties were saying the sky will fall. We will be, we, kids will be driving to school and elementary, and they'll be needing parking spaces. <laughs> today, today, if we were thinking about competing our students against other students in this country, in this world, without those basic math skills, to you and me, that would sound ridiculous, would it not? But back in that day, the sky literally was falling. Nobody thought, everyone thought that was ridiculous. Our students could not achieve to that level. Our students can. Our students are talented. Our students are gifted of all types. And we have to find and exploit that giftedness and ability. And it isn't that we should, one of the downfalls of these high stakes tests is that we pigeonhole students into remedial classes when they shouldn't be sitting in remedial classes. They should be learning that skill in a different method, in a different way, in a different job skill, and whatever it might be. Not, not all students learn the same way. So we have to look at this thing more intellectually instead of just letting it be driven down from the state or driven down from even the federal government. The park assessment will be a much more complex. I've seen questions, very much higher order thinking questions. We should be teaching students how to critically think. But that too is going to revolutionize the way we do teacher preparation programs at the universities and how we have to supply teachers staff development, great staff development in, in, our, in our school district. And the con uh, a comment was made before about speed. Yes, slow down, it is. We need to slow down because you, you don't learn this stuff overnight. We have to provide the teachers the tools of which to be successful and then their, their students will be successful. On the other side, it shouldn't take forever. You know, there is a sense of urgency. A child should only be in fourth grade once and a child should only be in sixth grade once and a child should learn sixth grade content during sixth grade, not sixth, seventh, and eighth. And that we owe our students. So whether I'm at the university or the, or, or the, 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 the um, school district, I have to continue to remind myself, are we in a better place today in terms of educating all? And we say that repeatedly. We believe all kids can learn. 
The question I ask my staff and myself is, is all students will learn. That is a commitment that we're not going to end the day until they all do learn, not some that maybe would learn without even our assistance, but all of those students, and particularly those students who need to be learned and then retaught and retaught and retaught. That is, that is the answer to a, a vibrant community. And our educational system, the quality of our system, is going to dictate the quality of our life in Pinellas County. And the higher that quality is, the higher the quality of life. It is the economic engine of our community. So I know that's a long answer for a question about FCAD, but put it in perspective, please, as educators, especially I speak to the future educators that I hold so dearly, because this is a wonderful profession, and we have to continue to lift it up so more and more bright intellectual people come into this wonderful profession, because you, you impact a community like no other profession can. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Yeah. And, and now I, I uh, ask, uh, you know, Chancellor Stewart, uh, because we've mentioned a couple times, you know, moving from the FCAT and, and how we're doing into uh, what we call more national curriculum, uh, referred to as the Common Core, and also the assessment that is going to accompany that uh, Common Core implementation of those standards. And the problem that we've always faced in education, standing here today, you know, uh, that kindergarten that's in the school today, what's this world going to look like when he or she becomes a senior in high school? That's, that's the tough job that a community and a school system and, and states have to deal with. And I think the, the strategy and the understanding uh, and that goes into the Common Core is, is a process, I think, to allow us to be more speculative and at the same time make some judgments along the way of whether that speculation is really being uh, accurate or not. And we're very fortunate to have someone who is, you know, in the process of, of at the state level, moving us, you know, toward that uh, common core adoption and implementation and also looking at how we assess that. And so, Chancellor Stewart, you're on uh, to, to bridge us uh, from FCAT to Common Core. Thank you. And um, if I understood correctly, Dr. Heller, I have the remainder of the time. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, I, I can yeah, take well, the. You know, we're, we're already out of time. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you guys have been so good, and that's what they're here for. Uh, I will try to be brief, but it was a, a walk down memory lane. I had forgotten about um, some of what Doug talked about. Um, and I, I think there's bits of what everyone has said that I would love to echo and amen. And um, I, I think that Mike Grego took almost everything that I want to say. Um, everyone in this room, I think, recognizes that it is important to measure what we want to see improve. Um, however, it, it must be in a healthy manner. Um, I don't think there's anyone in this room, I don't think there's anyone in the Turlington building or the Capitol that wants children to be so stressed out that they can't go to school. Um, but that's not to say that we shouldn't measure. And it should look a little more like Dr. Grego mentioned where it is the culmination, it is the play at the end of the practice, if you will. But I'm going to tell a personal story and I promise it will be short. Um, but I sat in the role of um, a brand new principal um, as we were completing some of what Doug talked about and as we were moving into what Governor Bush was implementing. And that was back in the day when we took new principals and we put them way out. We hid them as far out in the district as we could possibly hide them. So I was the principal of an elementary school of about 700 students, and 96% of them were on free or reduced lunch. So you know that was a challenge. And we were back in that day, you'll remember this, Doug, we were critically low performing. I mean, that should have been shocking to us to be critically low performing, but it kind of wasn't. And we sort of patted those students on the head and said, they're doing as well as they can. And I happened to be the principal of that school the first year 
that Jeb Bush's grading system came out. And I didn't like it very much. Before the grades came out, I didn't like it very much. And I said, the students at my school cannot be expected to achieve to the same level as the students at that school. And the first year that grades came out, we were, shouldn't have been a big surprise, we were an F. And while we might have been okay with having been critically low performing, we were not okay with being an F. We were not an F, and by golly, we were not going to remain an F. And we didn't even know what we were doing back then. Some of you that were in education back then, no, we didn't, we didn't know anything about um, driving instruction. Even though that is absolutely what the assessment should do, we didn't know how to make that happen. And so I intuitively did what we thought we needed to do, and that was call teachers together. And we worked in the summer, and we developed a plan, and we implemented that plan, and everybody was together on it. It was sort of like all being in the sinking ship together, and we, by golly, were going to make it through this. And we did. We moved from an F to a C in one year. First year we were an F, the next year we were a C. And I really wasn't saying those ugly things about Jeb Bush quite so much anymore. And it wasn't because, oh, look what we did. We moved from an F to a C. That was not the reason. But it was what we did for the students in that school. That everyone, all the principals that had preceded me, I didn't, I didn't, wasn't making them worse when I came on board. <clears throat> but in fact, it was that grading, that icky one letter, sum it up in one letter, that really changed the behavior and changed the instruction. And while I think that there are some things that can change and some things that it can improve, if we can use assessment to drive instruction in a very appropriate manner, then we've done a great service to the students in the state of Florida. So that's my little, little pitch to measurement. And let me talk about moving into Common Core. I, I, Nancy and I are both 35 years old. <laughs> we both entered the classroom in 1975. I, as a recent graduate of USF College of Education. Yay for the College of Ed here. <laughs> and um, I, I think that this is in my years in public education in the state of Florida, there has not been as much change as in the last year and a half. No question about that. But it is also some of the most exciting change that I can think of happening. Um, somebody said, and I don't remember who, about um, the critical thinking and higher order thinking and the things that in the 1900s we thought education was all about and what we should be doing. And that's what Common Core brings us back around to. It is about having kids discover their own. It really will be the thing, I believe, and I've said it for those that have heard me talk about Common Core, I believe it's the thing that really will get at those mission statements that are on lots of walls around the state of Florida, probably all over the nation, creating lifelong learners. Because we are no longer making passive learners by the teacher disseminating the information. We're helping students discover it on their own and be able to answer questions that they never could before. So quick example, because the questioning, and Doug said this, said this before about assessment um, changing the way we instruct, the standards that Nancy talked about that are so important that we have. But it is the questioning. Common Core, content-wise, is not a huge shift from our next generation Sunshine State standards. It's a shift in the way we instruct students. And so, for those of you in the audience that have heard me use the Sarah example, I apologize. But back in the day, we would have had students read a passage, and we would say to students, what color was Sarah's dress? Very factual recall. And we'd call on, probably call on the student in the classroom that we knew could give the answer. And they would say, it was yellow. Now what teachers do is they will have students read the passage and they will say, why on this particular day did Sarah choose 
to wear a yellow dress. And so we'll call on Doug, and Doug, like every great fourth grade boy, will say, oh, I don't know. Because <laughs> that's the way Doug is. And so the teacher will then say, Nancy, help out your friend Doug and tell us why on this particular day did Sarah choose to wear a yellow dress. And Nancy, because she always liked to please the teacher, will say, the others were dirty. <laughs> ah! Well, sorry, sorry, Nancy. I'm going to have to move on to, to my friend um, Mike and ask Mike. And um, the response becomes, because it was her mother's birthday, and she was missing her mother, and her mother's favorite color was yellow, and so she chose to wear the yellow dress in honor of her mother on this day. And so then the teacher will then move on to someone else and say, show me in the reading passage how Nancy got that answer. And then the teacher will go back to Doug and say to Doug, Doug, tell me, why on this particular day did Sarah wear the yellow dress? And I would suggest to you that that is why teachers went into and are going into education because they want to create those learners in their students. Another very quick story, promise this one is short. My daughter teaches kindergarten in Florida public school. And even though fair has a negative connotation, she did tell me once, but the resources that come with it are really pretty amazing. And she uses that as a gauge for herself as to whether or not she's been successful in teaching her students to read. But she had a student that she thought, absolutely, this student, I'm never going to be able to teach this child to read. And one day, she was teaching a science lesson. And yes, she was teaching science. Yay. And she asked the question, the, the moon is not a star, but why does it look like it is? And nobody in her kindergarten classroom could answer that. Not too surprising, but nobody could answer that. Not even her gifted students. But the little boy that she knew she was not going to be able to teach to read said, because it is reflecting the sun's light. Yikes. And she never looked at him the same again. And that again, I would suggest to you, is why we all went into education and why you all are in education. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Thank you, Pam. And, and I, I think you can see why, you know, the Common Core uh, is a movement in the, in the right direction and, and leading us into the, the, the critical thinking that uh, is so needed. And also, I just want to, you're going to hear a lot about a, a term called PARC. And that's the assessment that's going to come with the uh, Common Core. And what that PARC means is it's the Partnership for Assessment of Readiness or Readiness for College. And another word that's added, and Terry is here, and I know a number of you in here that with corporations, add the word careers. So often we've got caught up in whether or not, you know, we're teaching and preparing individuals for colleges in, in that particular career and, and moving on into that field. But we also have to look at individuals who may not be going to college, but the community needs the kind of skills that we can prepare. So the, the Common Core is also going to be assessing how well we're moving individuals, not only on their readiness for college, but also their readiness for careers. Now, get another round of applause to the panel right quick. And now it's your turn. Uh, Jacqueline Schuett and David Clement, they have microphones, and uh, you've got questions, and you can just say when you ask your question who you want to direct it to. Uh, that way you'll keep me the middleman out of it. And, uh, and, and again, any, any, any question is fair game along the topic. The other thing I would ask you to do is you can't have that microphone. It belongs to Jackie 
and David. So you can talk into it, but you can't take it from their hands because sometimes that leads to a long statement. So, okay, we have a question over here. Oh, uh, hi, my name is uh, Alex Adams. I'm the president of Tarpon Springs uh, Campus. Uh, I'd like to just give a quick little background story of me. I was uh, Minnesota born, uh, so I had Midwest schooling. Uh, we really didn't focus on the comprehensive test, so uh, moving here in eighth grade, I found that we did uh, focus on this. And my first test, um, I did uh, one of the best in my middle school. I was one of the best testers in my, in my whole entire middle school. I say that because um, I was always concerned when I got to, to, got to classrooms throughout high school and middle school that there was this, um, not necessarily a criteria, the Sunshine Standards, but this uh, feel from the teachers that we needed to teach to the FCAT and teach to that test. And, and they never felt like they could uh, cover material that maybe they wanted to cover that would broaden that critical thinking. So my question for uh, Ms. Stewart is, uh, will the Common Core uh, present that problem like FCAT did, where uh, teachers feel that they need to cram information that maybe they don't think is necessarily as useful as information that they would give, if that, if that question makes sense? Yeah, I think it makes total sense. So um, I think that every teacher has an obligation to teach the standards. I, I, I hate the phrase teaching to the test, um, yet we don't really have trouble teaching to the AP test. But we, we, you know, if, if it's important knowledge for our students to know, I think it's important that we teach it. Um, panels of experts and teachers throughout Florida determine the Sunshine State Standards and the Next Generation Sunshine State Standards. So it's very important that teachers teach to those standards. I think what we have problems with, or I hope that what we have problems with in education is when teachers pass out those worksheets that are drill and it, that's inappropriate and, and doesn't even do a good job of preparing students for life, testing, or anything we want to prepare students for unless we think we're going to send them out into the world to deal with worksheets all day. Um, so I, I think it's what's most important is that um, teachers have a clear understanding of what standards are. I think that you can ask the teachers that are in the room. They can tell you their standards. Um, and that's what's important. Should there maybe be a week where you brief kids on how to take a test? Probably. But nothing more. Um, we should be driven by the standards. The Common Core will become the standards. And again, they were developed, it was a grassroots effort um, that groups of governors around the nation, um, it, it may have a national curriculum look, but only because it came from states upward. Um, and I think that is probably very important distinction to make. But it will be important that teachers teach those standards. Um, and I believe that, not that my example is great, but if teachers um, use the questioning skills where it does dig deeper, they'll pre be prepared for whatever test is put in front of them. Okay, thank you, Pam, and thank you for the question. Next question. Um, I remember when I was in high school, my name is Lisa Garcia, I'm the legislative liaison for the Seminole Campus Student Government. When I was in high school, like, I know you take the test when you're in 10th grade, and then if you don't pass, you have to retake it over and over and over and over again. By the time you're in high school and you've been taking this test since you were in third grade, it just, it get, you get to the point where you were just like, okay, the FCAT's coming, like, whoop de doo Like, you didn't really, you weren't motivated to take this. And there were, there was a lot of issues with my friends not passing this test, and it was a stipulation for them to graduate. If they didn't, if they didn't pass this test by the time they were a senior, they didn't get the diploma. They might have had a 4.2 GPA, but they couldn't get the diploma. Is that going to be in effect with this new test, or is it going to, is that, is that still going to be the same thing, or is it going to be different? I guess you you can, got that honor um, that thanks for asking that question. Um, there will still be a graduation um, cut score, if you will, a, a score determined on the park that Dr. Heller referenced. Um, that students will need to meet in order to be able to graduate. What that cut score is has not been determined yet. Um, 
all of the commissioners of education and all the participating states come together and they make decisions solely about that. But the state of Florida, depending on what the, the level one, two, three, four, and five will be, um, Florida will have its own decisions to make with regard to what is the graduation cut score, if you will. Um, and there, that will still continue to be a requirement um, and there will still be the, the ability for a student to retake or to use um, an SAT or an ACT score in its place. I was just going to ask Doug, you know, since he's you know, part of this to start, how, how would you go about making sure that that cut score is a realistic score based on the curriculum and, and the standards that uh, are in place? I, I think you need to look at uh, what it takes to be successful as a citizen when you leave. I mean, the idea is that you shouldn't leave high school without the literacy skills capable of being a successful citizen. And, you know, when I was a kid, Growing up in, in St. Pete, we graduated a lot of kids out of high school, as, as Nancy said, that, you know, were reading at the second, third grade level. Back in the day, you know, you could raise a middle class family with, you know, very basic literacy skills or, or not a high school diploma. You can't do that anymore. And so my answer is we got to, you know, we got to talk, we got to look at what it takes to be successful in college, what it takes to be successful in the 21st century in, 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 in employment. And you got to have those basic literacy skills, and the cut score ought to guarantee that when kids graduate, they're able to be successful citizens. Thank you, uh, Pam. Thank you, Doug. Next question. Jackie, you got the hands, you know. Uh, yeah. Hi, I'm Peter Kavanaugh. Um, I'm a voting senator for SBC's Seminole Campus. And I would like to add to her um, question earlier. I was one of those students at graduation. I am disabled. I've been in reading classes all my life, um, kindergarten through 12, and because of the Disability Act, uh, I was allowed to graduate without having to pass the FCAT standard for reading. So to Doug, I did not pass that. I'm very successful here at uh, SPC, making a living, and without those standards, I think I could be just fine. But I had to go through those steps. And um, one of my past teachers here, reading coach Ms. Peckerel, she could tell you she worked with me with the reading uh, for I think two years, and even with my sister. It was, it was very challenging, but to do the test wasn't easy. And I didn't look forward to it, but I had to go to um, uh, remedial classes just to get through. But I felt like I'm learning at a different level. You know, I'm not with my class. I'm not like at their level, but yet I'm their friends and I'm still there, but I'm not learning with them. So when they would ask me certain things about, you know, certain English questions, like, you know, what's a pronoun and this phrase and that phrase, past tense, well, I couldn't tell you because I never learned it. In remedial, they don't teach you those things. They just go verb, adverb. Now there's more technical parts to it that I didn't get to learn. Even, even in 12th grade, I didn't learn those. I'm learning those right now in college. That's why I'm here. But even, even not at a civil level, I failed your test. But I'm here today speaking to you. Um, I think I look normal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, I, I'd like to just uh, it, it was your comments, because I think one of the uh, strengths of our, our county schools uh, it is the it are the programs that we have for individuals who have exceptionalities and uh, you know I want to ask Dr. Regal uh, you know how he feels uh, and and how they uh, work with individuals who are coming through the school who may need an exemption or some kind of a, a waiver in, in 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 the case that we're talking about uh, here uh, so you want to address uh, that, how, how we do with the, uh, the, the students who may have not always the, uh, the, the thing. That's right. It, yeah, and that's what I want to address here that, so that we have opportunities for individuals who have those disabilities. Well, first of all, congratulations, and I'm glad you're here. Uh, and, and I want you to thank your coach and whoever those individuals along the way. 
uh, that we're helping you. I, I think that when we talk about all students, we truly need to define it as all. Uh, that's capital A-L-L, -L, not all but some. So students with learning disabilities, whatever they might be, they're provided additional resources. We have to get them to the finish line. That's all. That's the definition of all. As Pam Stewart said before, it can't be, but these kids can only, who are these kids? So we have seen a tremendous increase in our populations with students with learning disabilities who are graduating from high school. That is a testimony to not the assessment, but to the focus on what works and the focus on, again, instruction and focus on not warehousing students. And the focus on believing that students can learn and will learn. Uh, and if they, if they have a learning disability, then let's deal with it and let's work with it. Let's provide them the additional resources. Again, and, and this might be assistance along the way. And so if we, we see that we need to provide students assistance in third, fourth, fifth, it is repetitive. But our goal is always to ensure that that student can graduate and that that student can earn an income and become employed and so on and so forth. It has to, it, that's, that's how we work. I'm proud of the, the progress the state is making, obviously Pinellas County is making with students with disabilities. We cannot, we cannot just say, okay, we'll allow a different standard. But the important statement that this young man made, it isn't, that standard is not, dict, it shouldn't be totally dictated by one test. And I think that was his point. Uh, he was trying to say, you could be successful without that test, you could be this, but again, I'm going to go back to this if you only remember one thing, assessments should drive instruction. It sounded like it drove a lot of your instruction uh, that got you to where you're at. So we have to stay focused on the needs of individual students. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Next question. My question is directed to the superintendent. Uh, we've heard about the Common Core, and I'm a non-educational professional, so uh, maybe I'm a bit confused about it. Is it, first of all, um, a K through 12? Is it at all levels, grade school, middle school, high school implementation? And can you tell us uh, how does it, uh, five years from now when it's fully implemented, or when it's going to be fully imp implemented, how it will contrast with what the curriculum is today in our schools here in Pinellas? That's, that's a great question. And, and I think I'm going to piggyback on what Pam Stewart said before. This uh, next generation Sunshine State standards were put in place so that the, the jump between the um, St Sunshine State standards and the Common Core was not a quantum jump. And I think that a lot of times the Department of Education, they get, they get hit over the head, criticized for a lot of things, but that was very insightful is that you move curriculum, you move the standards and the benchmarks of this curriculum, you move it gradually. You don't move it from here to say, okay, I, I do the high jump at four feet, now I'm expected to do it at seven feet with no training in between. So the next generation, or what we even refer to now as that FCAT 2 as the assessment portion, was, was developed to bring us to the next level to prepare for 2014-15. So one of the beauties of it is, is that when we did an analysis between the next generation Sunshine State standards and the Common Core, the, I'm gonna say, as Pam said before, there's not tremendous differences in it. Because so we've been kind of um, easing into it, which is a, is a proper way of doing things. We talked about speed and doing things at a proper pace. Right now what we're doing is working with our teachers, and that's where um, you, you deal with large districts like Pinellas County or Hillsborough or or Miami Day. There's a lot of teachers, and it's about training. It's about training of the standards, so that we're not hitting students over the head with an assessment, of which you know some pe people would say, and I understand, assessment drives instruction. That, but we need to drive and, and educate our students. So the the change curriculum-wise, as Pam said before, isn't going to be massive. Um, it, that's my assessment of it. Can I just add All to right, that one, real yeah, quickly? Yeah, go ahead. Um, Last year, kindergarten students were taught the Common Core standards. This year, kindergarten and first grade students. Next year, it will be through the second grade. And at the same time that it's fully implemented K through two, third through 12th grade 
will be doing the blending so that the difference that Mike talked about will be a blended year so that they're still prepared for FCAT 2.0 but being ready for the following year when PARC is implemented. And it is, it's reading and math, actually it's literacy and math because the reading includes the writing piece as well. And it is also literacy infused into science and social studies and career and technical courses. And just to add to what Nancy has said, while I 100% believe that the, when I send my child into the science classroom, they need to be learning science. They also need to be learning the appropriate vocabulary that goes along with the science, and they learn, need to learn how to write appropriately within the science area. And the business world is telling us, teach them to write. And Ken uh, reminds me, by the way, we have you know our, our elected school board members here who give so much service, but uh, Ken Burke, Clerk County Court, stand up there, Ken, again. And also we have a commissioner here, a county commissioner, newly elected, who is one of my best friends and, uh, and colleague, and Janet Long, and you won't get a better, uh, again, you can't go wrong with Long, but she will also support education to the hilt. So Janet, stand up. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and um, any, you know, you two teachers, if you want to chip in here, uh, and parents. Back in 2009, uh, 2008, 2009, the Gates Foundation gave a lot of money to, um, to promote um, the Common Core State Standards Initiative. And with that, um, they came and reached out to Florida PTA, National PTA, um, we were one of five, one of the five states that were chosen to bring it out to the parents. They kind of did it in a very back, you had no idea what was really coming. Um, it was just a way to um, make parents aware that something new was coming and how were you going to receive this new material. It was more about opening communication and they looked at um, PTA as a very strong parent organization that was going to just open dialogue. And that's what they were able to do. They spent a tremendous amount of money um, in Florida. We had um, members throughout the state and every, every part of Florida just going out there and talking to parent groups and letting them know what's happening. So it's not, it, it seems like um, I've seen even in the audience and even back home um, from Palm Beach County, a lot of the teachers have this a look on their face like we didn't get the same information you guys got. And you know it 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 does baffle us as parents to say you know we're we're hearing it from two ends. There has to be a way that we're all listening to it together. So this is a great way for us to hear the same story or the same scenario at once. So just by you asking that question, I just assume that everybody's aware of it. Um, so thank you for asking because it brings me back a little bit to where it all began. And anything to add there? Um, yeah. Yeah, I would say that um, pretty much all the studies now say, I know this is so shocking, that the most important thing in education is the classroom teacher. Hello. Um, so I'm, it's encouraging to hear uh, Dr. Grego say that, you know, we need to be trained. And that, needs, that is the most important thing. Give us the skills, uh, give us the materials in a timely manner. Um, on the way here this afternoon, um, one of my colleagues told me that the FCAT scoring system changed and she found out about it in November and she teaches writing. So we can't have that kind of rush to judgment kind of thing. We need to have the materials in a timely manner. We need to have um, the ability to adjust our teaching techniques. Um, and I think this gradual release will be the way to roll. Very good, next question. Hi, my name's David Outlaw, and I, I liked your campaign slogan, so maybe if I go for office, you give me one, all right? Uh, I have a, a couple questions. I'm a, a manufacturer, and, I, and David and I met uh, because I thought that this institute was something that would really help us, because we're bringing education, business, and government together, and we're working on this problem. But my question is going to be to Mindy, because I'm a, I'm a grandparent now, and I have four grandchildren, and, um, and they're learning. Now, one of the things that we found out in manufacturing was that we learned different in manufacturing than you do in school. It's experiential. 
But we also learned a couple other things. I, I made some terrible mistakes, many trying to teach, so hats off to you teachers. But there's something that I learned recently with my own grandchildren, and that's called accelerated learning. And I have grandchildren that are reading far above what I did when I was in school. And what I want to know is, so, so the, the accountability goes back to the parents, but it's not always on the teachers. But what are we doing with our teachers and helping them to understand cognitive science, how your brain works, how you learn? And is that something that we should be doing? And is that, is that something that's out there? I'm only asking because I don't know. And maybe it is. And maybe, Michael, you might be able to tell me that. But that's my question. So you directed at Mindy? Well, I, I think it's just really important that we educate our parents as best as possible, and that's what I think the <coughs> Gates Foundation was trying to do. They were not very specific on um, looking at the standards. They took the standards and made them very bold. There were five or seven, seven standards. Mm -hmm. And they went ahead and they picked each, they looked at each one and they discussed it in a whole, not with any academic content at all. It was just about how we as parents were going to um, be receptive to the changes that were coming when, when our children would come home and if they were frustrated because now Common Core State standards are gonna be, our children are go definitely gonna be held to a higher accountability than they were before. Um, we have to teach our parents a little bit about frustration and the words that we choose to use with our children and um, to make sure that our negative feelings about high stake testing doesn't always um, reflect on our children where they walk in the classroom and say, well, my mom said I don't have to take the FCAT. Well, yeah, honey, you do. Um, my mom says it's not, you know, I had to be very careful in my house when I was talking about anything about the FCATs when my children were growing up. But it is important that we educate our parents and that's where PTA does come in. We do take our resources that are, that are given to us through the national PTA as well as the other organizational groups that we participate with and get it out there for the parents so they're educated. If I had to sit down and do fourth grade math right now, I'd be a little worried. So. Just keep on learning. I want to well, thank you, man. Real quickly Dr. add Michael. to that and, and thank the PTA. In Pinellas County, the PTA, along with the Ed Foundation, has a campaign of, of um, not only describing but educating parents about the Common Core. So I would encourage all of us to say that it's not one person's job or responsibility. And I thank the PTA because we need them. We need them to reach out to the parents and the parents. That, and to your point, the, the, the optimal is to involve parents in their child's learning to whatever extent, whatever degree. And I don't think manufacturers think differently. You're okay, I'm sure. So we're right. Thank you. All right, next question. Oh, you got, okay. Mr. Seminole. Oh, Mr. Stern. Okay. Thank you. Um, I won't take a mic. Uh, I'm Gene Stern. And uh, the question really is, um, I'm, I'm really interested in learning more about the Common Core because it was stated at the beginning that there was no commonality in testing throughout the United States, that a test here meant nothing to a person in Texas. So is the Common Core going to become a common <coughs> type of program so that there's uniformity? The, um, there are 46 states that have signed on to Common Core. I mean, it was up to states to choose or not choose. And the, some of those states that chose not to, some um, schools and districts have chosen to, even though the state did not choose. Um, there are two assessments. The one is PARC, as Dr. Heller already mentioned, and the other one is Smarter Balanced. And there's about 25, 27 in, in each group. Um, Florida is part of the PARC consortium. Even though there are going to be two separate tests, um, there will be some commonalities, and certainly the comparisons can be made of the park states that will be a lot more comparable than currently. Uh, I, I think that Florida's rigor is a lot higher than many other states, and yet, as Nancy pointed out, we kind of get a bad rap sometimes, and this will remove a great deal of that. There will still be some things that um, you won't be able to do an exact comparison. Um, some states will not be able to do the computer delivery of the assessment, and that so those states will be doing paper pencil, which will change the dynamic just a little bit in the comparison. 
Um, in addition, some states do not require Algebra I to graduate, so their set of students that take Algebra I will look quite different than Florida's set of Algebra I students. However, it's still much closer than we've ever been able to make state-to-state -state comparisons. Okay, next question. This poor lady in the back in the blue has had her hand up forever. Way back. Okay. Okay. I Your feel bad for you. <laughs> All right, over here. Oh, okay, I, I actually one. have many questions for you. I'm a pre-service teacher. Um, my name is Lauren Franzis. One of my questions is regarding the technology. In the past, FCAT has been simultaneously on a set day at a set time. How are you going to prevent the technology from bogging down if the entire county is doing the assessment at the same time? And will you have tech support at the various schools to help prevent that? That's probably one of the biggest challenges that we will face. Um, however, having said that, Florida is so much further along in the technology arena, and we do more computer-based testing in, throughout our state than any other state in the nation. Um, so where we're struggling, others are, are really struggling. Um, the State Board of Education made a legislative budget request uh, to the legislature this year um, that includes $448 million for districts for not only devices, but the bandwidth and the infrastructure so that and it, it's really important to think about this. It's not just so that on the testing day, the infrastructure is there. But more importantly, when we talked about Deborah P, that's the instructional validity piece. And if I'm not using that piece of technology in my instruction, you, you have a serious disconnect when a student then goes and sits in front of the computer to take that assessment. So it's going to have to be... Um, infused in everyday instruction, and I'm sure at, in pre-service you have a great deal of use with technology in the instructional practice, and that's going to have to have to exist. Whether or not we'll get that, um, any legislators in the room <laughs> that can help us out with getting our our LDR um, for the 448 million, that won't get us to a one-to-one -one device, but it will provide the infrastructure and will get us much, much closer um, than we currently are on the average throughout the state. Did you have a follow-up on that? I, I saw your hand come a little bit up. Yeah. yeah. So, so Wait a minute, Jackie, I'll get right with you quick. Thank you. How would you prevent the lower socioeconomic students in schools to have that access to the technology so that this way they're on the same plane level as the other students throughout the state? Um, that fortunately and kind of unfortunately is a district by district decision. Um, if I were the boss of the world, I would, I would ensure that we stretched um, that, so that there were devices available for students to take home so that even our low socioeconomic students have the ability to be able to be used to not only using the device, but being able to access information as they need to, and it's where my heart is, having been a principal as I described earlier. So I think we have to be mindful of that um, because if they go home and they don't have the ability to use that te technology, they're behind instructionally, and then when they take the test as well. Yeah, from a district standpoint, I mean, we've recently given out some, you probably saw it in the news, some netbooks to our Spanish-speaking, native Spanish-speaking um, students and parents. And that technology in that, in that home hopefully is bridging that, what we call the digital divide. But the only other thing we have, and it's a real issue that you're saying, is to, we have to expose those students during the day. So the first time they're sitting in front of a, a monitor taking the assessment, as, as Pam Stewart said, isn't, isn't on a park assessment. So we have to transfer some of the common formative types of work on there so that students become more proficient with it. Think back, folks, in terms of things that we were saying 10 or 15 years ago that are fairly commonplace now. We can get there. The, the, the key is not to make things and not to have sledgehammers if students are not, you know, reaching every place, every plateau at the same exact time. But good question. Yeah, very good question. Got time for one. Well, I see two hands. We'll do two questions. That one and the one in the back. Okay. If, 
Again, short. Good evening. My name is Grant Smith. Thank you all for a wonderful program. Um, I just need a little clarification. So as I understand it, we have the second generation Sunshine State standards that are being assessed using the FCAT test. We call that an assessment, a single test. We're calling it the nice word, the assessment. And what we're moving to is the Common Core standards that's going to rely on a single test that we're going to call an assessment. And we're calling this one the PARC test. Just, just for clarification, do I have that right? So we're taking pretty liberal use of the word assessment, because really what we're talking about is a single test. I heard Doug allude to the fact that with technology, there may be some alternative or authentic assessments that do become available. But as the current uh, plan stands, we're moving from one set of standards to another set of standards in one standardized test to another standardized test. Is that correct? That is correct. I think one of the distinct differences will be that um, part of the park assessment is given probably about the same time that FCAT is currently given, roughly. And then another portion that is much closer to the end of the year. The part that's given about when FCAT is given currently is more of a performance-based assessment um, so that it gets at some of that more authentic testing that was referenced before. So just as a follow-up, if I may, the stakes associated with the current FCAT test regarding grading students and tying teacher performance, a portion of that depending upon a standardized test, will that plan be in place when we move to the Common Core and this new test? Will the same high stakes component for students, schools, and teachers be in place? I, I can't speak directly for the State Board of Education and the legislature, but <clears throat> um, I, I believe that that will exist then. It won't look exactly the same because you cannot pick up the current school grading accountability system and plop it on top of PARC. Um, and any, any time we've had conversation with the state board or members of the legislature, we've been very clear that it will not fit. So there, there's going to have to be changes to that, which will include public input. Okay, thank you for the question. Thank you, Pam. But one last question then. And thank you. Um, my name's Sarah Bombley. I'm a doctoral student at USF. And I like, uh, there were great questions about technology. And I'd like to bring that back to students with disabilities. And I'd like to know if someone from the board would, like, would talk to us a little bit about um, an alternative assessment for those who may be earning a special diploma. And with regard to technology, what kind of accommodations might there be for those students with disabilities as they move to take this as park assessment? Yeah. Yeah, we'll let Dr. Ray go and then go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. go ahead first. Yeah. Um, there is an alternative assessment for students with disabilities, certain students with disabilities, depending on what their IEP um, states. And depending on how the IEP is written and what the student's disability is, there are accommodations that are made. And there's some amazing things that are happening with the adaptive technology for students with disabilities, whether it be on the alternative assessment or if those students are able to take the regular assessment but need some accommodations. And what we have found is, um, um, I'll use the word again, amazing things happening and probably um, in the world of um, students with disabilities, there has been more happening with technology and the use of technology in instruction in the ESE realm than percentage-wise happens in the regular education classrooms. So that, that does exist. It will continue to exist. The alternate assessment will be changed so that it will also align with Common Core like our current alternate assessment aligns to the next generation Sunshine State standards. Any other variable, though, um, based on the student's disability and their, their individual educational plan might be unlimited time, might be somebody reading the passages to them. So depending upon that, that um, what the IEP, the disability, uh, those accommodations are made. So there's a numerous variables that, that could Im impact that student. Typically, it's to assist the student and to um, and to assist that student be successful. And Nancy wants to weigh in on that a little bit. Sure. 
Is this on? Oh, yeah. I just wanted to go back to uh, the previous question about uh, the use of technology kind of from a boots on the ground point of view. We were talking in generalities. Uh, two or three weeks ago, we were giving the fair testing in our school to kindergarten, well, no, not kindergarten, but uh, help me out here, Sarah. Se uh, second grade, is that when they start? Third. Third, Third right, on the computer. Uh, because of the lack of bandwidth in our state, we were to test only on even numbered days, okay? So they marched all the kids down to the computers, they sat down to the computers, they logged on, spin, 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 crash, 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 go back to your classrooms, kids, after about half an hour playing this game. Then we tried it again on the next even number day. This went on for two weeks, okay? They, just, they are still now in my school taking the fair test. So when we talk about the m amount of money that's needed to make what we're talking about in the future work, it's huge. And think of the frustration of a third grader sitting there time after time. They have to plug in all these numbers and do all these crazy steps you cannot believe. And you should come and see, it's fun. Um, so when we're talking about, it sounds like still more high stakes testing to me, um, we've got a lot of fixing to do and, and I hope that those of you that are in a position to make these decisions for us and our children will think long and hard. Okay, thank you. Okay, well we've, we've concluded, we've got the, the questions and we want to make sure you, you know, we keep to our getting out here right around eight o'clock as much as possible, but you've been a wonderful audience and uh, there's been a wonderful panel. You want to share your uh, appreciation for them one more time? And, And uh, I, I want to say also thank you for all, all the teachers out there and all of you who support teachers. Uh, education is, is what's going to make this county very, very famous. So I'm going to turn it back to David Clement, and he's going to close the program. I'd like to uh, recognize the moderator and ask a round of applause for a great job of refereeing. And I'd also like to recognize the staff of the uh, Institute and of the administration staff of the Seminole campus who made this possible. Christopher, sorry, Jacqueline, and some, some of the administrators uh, at that table over there. Thank you very much. In closing, I just want to uh, let you know about our next two programs. The first is on February 6th when we start a new series on prison reform, when we hope to bring out facts and data that will lead to legislation that will reform Florida's prisons. February 6th, it's a free program. And our next Village Square is on March 20th, when we will look at sea level change and what might happen to the beach, beach nearest you. Sir Hurricane Sandy may have been a prelude to that. And on behalf of the Institute and St. Petersburg College, thank you for coming and good evening, safe trip home.